Hello, welcome to some video notes. Today we'll be looking at uh, topic 11.1. We'll be going into the uh, detailed, um, the extra detailed material about the immune response, about how specific immunity uh, develops through the different types of lymphocytes in order to um, create an immunity. And then we'll talk about different forms that immunity can, uh, can be gained or different ways immunity is gained and the pros and cons of them. And we'll also get into some specifics about some different types of diseases uh, that most people in the modern world now have immunity to them and uh, how we developed those immunities through um, vaccines. So your immune system really is built around the idea that it can identify specific um, parts of an organism, either a, be a virus or some type of bacteria, um, so that it can realize that that thing does not belong inside of your body. And so what it's looking for is what we call antigens, or basically these um, um, parts of the bacteria or the virus that be become unfamiliar or are unfamiliar to your immune system. So all along the surface of a cell membrane or the capsule around a virus, there are going to be various types of proteins, phospholipids, or glycoproteins, uh, lipoproteins, things like that, um, things embedded in the cell's uh, membrane. And that it's going, they're going to be there for various tasks. They might be there for some specific type of communication or helping them to adhere to a surface. Uh, they might helping them with transport. Uh, whatever the um, different reason for these things to exist in the membrane, uh, the thing is that your immune system, uh, when it is, uh, you know, the white blood cells are moving around through your body, if it happens to bump into a white blood or a bacterial cell, and it's kind of feeling along the surface of the cell membrane, and it doesn't really recognize these materials on the surface of the cell membrane, it's basically looking at the antigens that are present, and if it doesn't recognize the antigens on the outside of that bacterial cell, uh, then it's going to trigger the immune response because it, it's basically signaling that it's it doesn't belong in the body because it's not familiar. So um, there are a wide range of different types of antigens that exist. It really depends on the type of pathogen. Um, but really, uh, when we think about the immune response, what it needs to do in order to us to gain immunity about something is it once it realizes that there are antigens present on this bacteria cell that, um, that are not recognized, it then needs to go through the process of building up your specific immunity through the immune response to create antibodies that are specific to that antigen. And so if we here we've got a kind of square-shaped antigens on the outside of, uh, of this bacteria cell here, right? And so what we're going to need is to start producing antibodies that match those antigens so that the antibodies will stick to those antigens and increase the efficiency of our immune response. And so we're going to talk in more detail about how this, how this occurs. And so the word antigen, you might have remembered all the way back from 3.4 when we talked about our blood groups. We talked about um, the polygenetic inheritance of blood groups and the fact that we have a co-dominance where we can have A and B uh, alleles being expressed at the same time. Uh, and so that's also where the concept of an antigen was, was introduced, because if you remember back when we talk about different blood types, there are different types of, there are four types of blood, and because of antigens and antibodies on those different types of blood, that really determines whether or not different types of blood can be mixed together and, you know, obviously do damage to the individual or to help them. So, giving an example, we have uh, A type blood here. And so A-type blood has uh, antigens for A-type blood um, on it. And if you are an A-type blood person, in addition to having A-type blood antigens on your blood cells, you also have these guys here, anti-B antibodies. And basically antibodies that are designed to recognize uh, B-type blood. And so if for every instance, <coughs> if B blood somehow got into your body, um, those antibodies would recognize that those are red blood cells that don't belong in your body because they have the B antigen versus the A antigen. And so the antibodies for uh, in the plasma of our blood would then attack 
me and stick to the B antigen and on the B blood, uh, which would cause the blood to start to get sticky, normally starts to form blood clots. And if you know it's a small amount, eventually the white blood cells can de destroy through phagocytosis, can break these down. However, if too much B blood and A blood are mixed together at the same time, uh, that would be a big problem because the massive amount of blood clotting uh, could probably clog up the circulatory system leading to like a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. So we don't really, we can't mix uh, B blood and A blood together, all right? Even if we were to separate the plasma uh, from the B blood, because B blood itself also has these uh, anti-A antibodies, so we could remove those antibodies um, through centrifuge. Uh, we can't give them the red blood cells, even if we remove the plasma, because the red blood cells will have a bad reaction with the plasma uh, of the person with the A-type of blood. And so A-type and B-type blood cannot be mixed together, right? Uh, when we have a codominant situation, somebody has AB blood, um, they have AB blood, and we, uh, because being codominant, both the A and B antigens are present. Now, the body, if you have AB uh, type of blood, you don't express any genes that create the antibodies for either of them, because either A or B antibodies um, in your plasma would, would cause your blood to become sticky and clot, and then you wouldn't be able to survive that way. So you don't produce any of these antibodies. So AB blood actually can receive any type of blood from anybody because as long as you remove the antibodies, it's not going to become a problem. So if we take an A person's blood and we centrifuge it, so we just get the red blood cells and we put the red blood cells in, it will be fine because there are no antigens, or sorry, antibodies that match the antigens for A. Same thing with person who is B, all right? As long as we separate the plasma and the red blood cells and just give them the red blood cells, they should be fine because AB blood doesn't produce any antibodies. So we say that it is the universal recipient, all right? Same thing goes if we were to give them O-type blood, all right? If we removed the plasma and just gave them O-type blood, uh, the cells themselves, it would be fine. If you are an O-type person, all right, you have neither A or B antigens on the outside of your blood cells, but you have both of the antibody types. And so we would say that we, we call you the universal donor. So this idea that if, again, if we removed the antibodies, all right, if we remove the plasma from your blood and we centrifuge it, so just the red blood cells are being used, we can give that to anybody. Right? We can give it to person A, person B, or person A, B, because there are no antibodies on the outside, or antigens, sorry, antigens on the outside, they're not going to have a negative reaction with the antibodies. Unfortunately for a person who has an O-type blood, though, uh, they can only get blood from other O-type people. If I gave a red blood cells of A, it would react with the antibodies. If I gave them B, it would react with the antibodies. If I gave them AB, it would be really bad because it would react with both antibodies and very, very sticky and clotty. So though AB can be um, get blood from anybody, O can be given blood to anybody, but O can also only get blood really from other O types. And so if you have O type blood, because your blood both can be given to anybody and your blood can only be given to other O types, it's important that you donate your blood to blood drives and to hospitals because they need to make sure they have a good supply of it. Uh, if someone comes in and they don't necessarily know what their blood type is and they need to give them blood very, very quickly, they will give them blood, O type blood uh, first because they know that it shouldn't cause any negative uh, reactions with anyone because um, so, it is the universal donor. So again, the whole reason why these exist, these antibodies, or if we want to use the appropriate term, the more scientific term would be called them immunoglobins. They're protein, globular proteins that are there for building your immune system. Uh, they're there to detect specific antigens. And so your immune response uh, will realize that there is a foreign antigen present if an antibody sticks to it. All right? And so, for example, the blood types, if the wrong type of blood is being presented into the body, it's going to cause antibodies to stick to it, which leads to blood clots. And eventually it could be fatal if those blood clots are not eventually um, broken down uh, through phagocytosis. So again, O-type blood being universal donor means that it doesn't have any antigens against any recipient's immune system, so it can go to anyone. Or AB is the universal recipient because it doesn't have any antibodies in its plasma. It doesn't matter what antigens are on the blood, A, B, or O. It doesn't matter which type. There's no antibodies in their plasma, so they should never have a negative reaction. So when we talk about immunity from like the rest of this presentation, when we keep using the word immunity, Immunity means that you have a strong enough of an immune system response 
that any infection that got into your body would be eliminated quicker quicker than it could actually cause the disease. So you don't really get the disease. That doesn't mean that you never get infected. You get infected with these, these bacteria that cause disease all the time. It's just that your body uh, identifies them and removes them from your body or breaks them down or kills them faster than they can multiply enough to actually physically cause your body systems to not function well and express symptoms of the disease. So immunity can come through different forms. So we have innate immunity, which is the immunity that you were born with coming from certain genetic factors, right? There are certain genes for, pass for just general antibodies that are produced into your bloodstream. And then we have the acquired immunity that you gain over, you know, existing, right? Under the acquired category, there can be different ways that that immunity is acquired. It can be an active, or, and if it's an active immunity, that means that the production of antibodies was done by you. So you make your own antibodies. So an example of this would be this idea of natural exposure to the infection, right? So an active acquired immunity would be you getting sick, right? If you get sick, um, you know, you recover and through the process of building memory cells, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, you gain the ability to pr produce antibodies very, very quickly to that antigen that made you sick, that was attached to the bacteria that made you sick. And so now you've, you've basically acquired immunity to one specific strain of a bacteria, for example. We can also give you artificial active immunity. And so artificial active immunity is where vaccines come along. And so a vaccine is normally a part of a disease, bacterium, maybe just the antigens, or it might be a dead or weakened form of the bacteria, of the pathogen. And by giving you that pathogen, um, we artificially expose you to the disease, but again, a weakened form of the disease. So you're more likely to be able to build an immune system response uh, and recover from it and then get that acquired active immunity, okay? We can also do it in other ways. We are passive acquired. And this is when ready-made antibodies are just given to you. So for an example, if we um, passive immunity, the antibodies might have come from another organism and they might be really specific to that antigen. But because you didn't make them, uh, your ability to respond to the bacterium again or to the pathogen again is severely limited. Um, it really depends on how much of those um, antibodies are still in your system all right, before you get exposed to the bacterium again. So there is some natural passive immunity that comes from your, uh, your mother, all right? So um, when you were developing, the placenta had your circulatory system and your mother's circulatory system exchanging materials. And some of the materials that were exchanged were antibodies because they're very, very small. And so they would just pass right through the layers of the placenta and get it into your circulatory system. So uh, these antibodies came from the mother. They were there to help keep you from getting sick um, right after you were born, but you don't have the ability to produce them yourself. And so eventually <laughs> they will either be used up, uh, they might get broken down, or they get filtered out uh, from your kidneys, right? from your blood through your kidneys. And so they eventually fades over time. We can also artificially give you the antibodies from an alternative source if you've become infected with the disease in order to help you feel better, uh, get over the infection. So this is actually really common for rabies. Uh, for rabies, if someone gets infected with rabies, we don't normally vaccine people against rabies because I mean, rabies is pretty rare for anyone to come in contact with it. So if we, we could give you the vaccine, but then you're probably gonna lose that immunity if you don't get exposed to that specific pathogen again before eventually your immune system cells um, just die and, and not really get used again. So if someone actually gets exposed to something a little bit more rare like rabies, we can just give them the antibodies that they need in order to help fight off the disease rather than you know having them get sick and, and have rabies. Okay, so when we think about the immune response, uh, what we're looking at is different types of lymphocytes uh, doing uh, their role to allow you to gain this immunity. So this would be the example of, let's say, um, acquired active immunity, right? So let's say you get sick. So uh, you get infected with some type of pathogen, right? And so here your, your oops, that's pretty dark, let me use yellow. So here that pathogen is getting picked up by a macrophage. And so the macrophage is going to digest the bacteria through phagocytosis. 
And after doing so many times of digesting a certain number of these bacteria, every once in a while a macrophage is going to be like, you know what, I'm, I'm eating a lot of these things, I maybe want to get the other immune system cells uh, activated as well. Maybe this could be something that we get exposed to again. And so rather than just completely killing every part of the bacteria, through the process of doing um, of breaking it down with the lysosome, it's actually going to save the antigen, the things that it was interacting with on the cell's surface, on the cell's membrane. And then what it's going to do is it's going to pass that, ant uh, that antigen off to what we call a helper T cell. And so the helper T cell is now activated and it's like, okay, I've got this antigen. This antigen uh, needs some antibodies uh, to be created for it. And so the, anti the helper T cell is then going to take that antigen and it's going to pass it off to a B lymphocyte, and so a B cell. And so B cells, when they're, they're undifferentiated, when they have not been active yet, they can uh, either get activated by the bacteria directly. So they, they can actually interact with these antigens from uh, on the surface of the bacteria cells and, be, and start the immune response this way. Or they can be acted by a T helper cell. And so a helper T cell can physically give them the antigen and say, you know, hey, you need to be making antibodies for this. And so the initial parts of the immune response is we need to start with, um, most of the time what we're starting with is the uh, macrophages doing phagocytosis, breaking down the bacteria, eventually isolating that specific antigen that is unique to that bacterial cell, giving it to a helper T cell who then activates a B cell with it, or in some instances, if you're, you, know, you have a lot of bacteria in a certain area, there is a certain chance that the, help, the B cells can be activated directly just by interacting uh, with the bacteria themselves. They might be able to um, um, grab onto the antigen uh, present on that bacteria. And so then once a B cell becomes activated, we move into the second phase, right? And so here, these are these, these steps I just kind of talked about. So, then in the next phase, the B cell has now been activated. And so the B cell, what it's going to do is it's going to um, generate and uh, it's going to um, spatially uh, differentiate and specialize into producing a very specific type of antibody that mats matches that antigen. And once it knows how to make the antibody specific to that antigen, it's going to then divide and it's going to become two different types of cells, a memory cell and a plasma cell. And so the memory cell is going to just stay there, inactivated. It's going to go into like a dormant state. And the whole point of the memory cell is that it already has the information for making the antibodies that match this antigen. So if the disease ever comes back, we can really quickly release a bunch of antibodies specific to that bacteria cell into the blood because we have a bunch of memory cells that can be activated and they just immediately start dumping the antibody into the blood. However, we still have this infection we have to fight off, the first infection, right? And so that's what the plasma cells are going to do. And so the plasma cells are going to start dumping lots and lots of copies of those antibodies into the blood plasma, into the tissue fluid. And so the antibodies will travel through the blood and through the tissue fluid, and if they bump into the bacterial cell, they're basically highlighting the bacterial cell and helping the macrophages find them so that the macrophages can, you know, continue to digest them quicker, right? Um, and then there are also some instances uh, where it can immobilize the bacteria. So sometimes the bacteria all get stuck together because of the, anti because of the um, antibodies. And so they can't move very well and so they can't get to nutrition. And so they can just die from just not having access to nutrition uh, and so things like that. And they're also, uh, we can limit their ability to do cellular division. They, they can't do binary fission very well because they've got all these antibodies stuck to the outside of them that are preventing them from having the space necessary to grow. So there's, there's a lot of different effects that come from antibodies, but probably the main one we think about is them highlighting the, um, the specific bacteria that need to be destroyed. And so if the macrophages uh, bump into a bacterial cell that has antibodies on it, it immediately uh, does phagocytosis. Because if it has antibodies on it, it doesn't belong in the body. And so it doesn't have to like double check and make sure that it's, if it's a good bacteria or a bad bacteria. Okay, so that's the primary immune response. And once we have those memory cells, we have a potential immunity. And so if we get a secondary immune response, so let's say, for example, uh, that bacteria comes back, we get infected with it again, all right, the phagocytosis uh, done by um, a macrophage, it could then present 
the antigens directly to the memory B cells, and the memory B cells can just immediately start dumping out the antibodies right away. So they can divide again, uh, becoming more memory B cells for later and to hold on to that immunity. And so when they divide, some of them become plasma cells, some of them stay as memory B cells. And then the plasma cells that come from that division do what was doing up what was up here, which is dumping the antibodies into the tissue and then of course helping with the um, immune response. And so if the immune response is fast enough, uh, you could be infected with that disease, uh, with the pathogen that causes that disease uh, right now, and you'd have no idea because your immune response is so quick, you're essentially immune to that disease and you never get to show the symptoms to that disease. So the key thing about your immunity this way is that you have to keep getting exposed to the pathogen every so often or you can lose that immunity. The memory cells, they can last for a good amount of time, but they're not, they don't live forever. And so if you don't get exposed to this pathogen again and then all those memory cells eventually die, then you've lost that immunity. And so then you're gonna to have to go through the primary immune response again, and hopefully you can, you're still have a good strong immune system and you can get over it and you can gain that immunity back. This is something that astronauts have to deal with because when astronauts go up into space and they spend you know, six or eight months floating around in the space station, uh, the space station is a sterile environment. Everything up there is clean and void of bacteria. And so uh, there are certain bacteria that we're exposed to every day that we have an immunity to that we don't really have to worry about getting sick. And so when those astronauts come back down, they have to be revaccinated against certain types of illnesses because while they've been up in space, they have not been exposed to those bacterial cells. They've lost that immunity from their B cells dying. And so they're essentially no, they're immune, they're not immune to it anymore. And so we have to um, give them the weakened form of the uh, bacteria again through a vaccine. And then it allows them to gain that immunity back before you know they, they can go off and go home and then live their, their normal lives. So when we talk about an antibody, uh, we keep seeing like a Y type of lettering and design whenever you look at these images, and that's actually fairly accurate. So they are kind of Y in shape. And so what we have here is along one these two sides, we have what we call heavy chains, because they're much, much larger. And then we have what we call light chains, which are the top parts. But then the really important part is right at the end of both of these chains, are what we call the highly variant areas. And so the last section of those two chains, they can be modified very, very easily and quickly. And so that's how the antibodies, the basic structure of an antibody can just be modified very quickly by your plasma cells in order to change them to match the antigen, All right, And so because they have this, this flexibility uh, in their design, they are uh, easy for us to develop uh, antibodies specific to different uh, antigens. And so we think about how antibodies function and what they're doing to help you uh, get over some type of illness. There are three major categories. So we have neutralization. So neutralization, basically if it's a toxic material, so not all antigens necessarily have to be on bacteria. They can be toxic material, waste material uh, produced or certain types of protein toxins that are produced by, uh, by a pathogen. So it will stop toxins from invading cells because now they're too large to get into the cell because they've got this big amino uh, aminoglobin and big antibodies that stuck to it. Uh, this also works for certain viruses. If there are viruses that have antigens specific enough uh, or consistent enough that we can develop antibodies against them, um, the antibodies can stop the viruses from getting in because now they're again they're too large and and they can't really interact with the surface of the uh, of the the host cell that they want to invade. We have opsonization, which is this idea that we're marking them for phagocytosis. And so if you have uh, antigen attached to you, a macrophage is going to be uh, more efficient in being able to find you and to do phagocytosis and break you down and kill you, right? And then we have agglutination, where basically they are glued together. And so by the antibodies having that Y shape, you can actually have two different pathogens. So the pathogen could be stuck here, the pathogen could be stuck here, and so now they're all stuck to each other. And so uh, their ability to move around is going to be reduced. So they might not be able to get to nutrition uh, in order to keep themselves alive. They also 
sometimes are not going to be able to do um, cellular reproduction, do binary fission, because their, their antibodies around them have prevented their movement and prevent them from being able to increase in size so that they can do cellular division. And so these three main categories are, uh, sorry, four, there's four. Uh, there's, those are the three main ones I think of. And then there's a fourth one, sorry, uh, which is uh, complement activation. Uh, this is basically there are antibodies that can encourage um, other components to attach to the pathogen and attack it uh, and helping to lyse the cell. So these are antibodies that help things that aren't macrophages attach and destroy the cell. So there might be other types of um, toxins uh, in the blood or not toxins, but other types of material that's toxic to the cell that can help break it down. There are also ones that can maybe destabilize the antibodies or destabilize the bacterial cell. And by destabilizing the bacterial cell, the bacterial cell just die by themselves rather than um, needing a macrophage to digest them. So up to this point, you're probably thinking your immune system, it sounds Fantastic. We love the immune system. It's doing such a great job protecting us from hundreds and thousands of different type of pathogens that could be making us sick. Unfortunately, there is a dark side of the immune system, and that is the immune disease, the autoimmune disease, the idea that your immune system is attacking something that actually isn't dangerous to you. And so an autoimmune system is when you have an allergy. And so here we're looking at someone who's gone through an allergen test. And so a real simple way to do an allergen test, right? They have kind of a chart marking which material that they have used in different locations. They take a little bit of that material, they might inject it under the skin or they might just rub it on the surface of the skin so that some of the, that the material get into the tissue fluid and into the blood. And they see whether or not you have an immune response. And so the swelling and the heat and the itching and the pressure, that's all coming from the immune response. That's coming from the macro phages, the white blood cells, uh, basically freaking out and trying to attack and destroy all of those antigens. And so a minor immune response, it, it can be kind of annoying, right? You get maybe get hives, you get itchy, you get swelling, um, but some strong uh, as, uh, uh, immune responses like asthma, for example, uh, could lead to swelling in like important areas like the throat. All right, and so if the swelling in the throat is too great, then you lose the ability to really breathe very well, and you can even get so bad to the point that you might even suffocate um, uh, because of that immune response. And so an immune response like this against um, an allergen is basically triggered by a small little uh, organic molecule called histamine. And so histamine is really good at just going around and activating leukocytes, specifically basophils and mast cells. And those are the ones that really trigger all the swelling and the heat and the itching and the general, um, sorry, and the general immune response, right? And so these basophils and mast cells, they're found all over through your connective tissue, they're in your different tissue layers. And so if they get activated by histine in that area uh, where that, that, that antigen has been present, uh, the uh, response can be quite quick. Anyone here, if, if, you, if you have a, an allergy or you know someone that has an allergy, uh, sometimes the, the reaction can be extremely fast and, and almost severe. And that's again, because of these cells being just located in all these different tissue layers, uh, and they're there to react very, very quickly uh, if they get activated by histamine. And so histamine has a number of effects upon uh, the body, but this key thing for increasing the immune response is it helps increase the permeability, permeability of your capillaries. So if you remember, your capillaries have those little pores between some of the cells, which allow the white blood cells to move through. And also, you know, some proteins like antibodies can move through that as well. Uh, so we increase, we basically will vasodilate this layer all right, and by increasing the dilate, by dilating it, we, we spread out the layer a little bit more, which opens the holes, which helps more antibodies and more white blood cells to move from the blood into the tissue layer. That also is one of the reasons why we see reddening because of the dilation of the blood cells. This is also why there's swelling because there's an increase of fluid moving from the blood into the tissue. Uh, and also there also can be why it's a little bit hotter and some itching can uh, occur from that as well. Okay, and so this allows the white blood cells to move into the area where this, um, this 
allergen is located uh, and, and break it down, basically treating it like a pathogen, imagining it's a pathogen. So it's very, very similar to the early effects of an infection by a pathogen. However, we normally don't go into the full immune response where we, we go and produce a whole bunch of antibodies with B cells, memory B cells, and things like that. Normally, the macrophages, the basophils, and the mast cells are the ones that mostly just attack and destroy the, the pathogen as, as much as possible, or as quick as possible. So it is an unfortunate side of the immune system that sometimes things don't turn out exactly the way you want, and things that aren't really toxic to you, things that are not pathogens, uh, can trigger an immune response, and that's what we call an allergen. It's something that causes the immune response, but is not actually a, a toxic material, a pathogen. So again, with histamine, the overall results of an allergic, or allergic response, inflammation, or what we call hives, which are very specific locations of inflammation, itching, sneezing, watery eyes, you, you probably experience something similar to this if you have allergies. Um, being hypersensitive to these allergens can be a big problem for some people if they occur naturally in your environment. You might have to take extensive steps to avoid being around certain areas, maybe not going outside very much during the spring or keeping your windows shut during the spring so you know if you're allergic to pollen, things like that. If you're allergic to bee stings or if you're allergic to certain types of food, then obviously you're gonna have to avoid those things as much as possible. Uh, and worst case scenario, if you really, really need something to help you with your immune response, you can use a drug called an antihistamine. And so antihistamines basically get in there and they block histamine receptors. So histamine receptors, when histamine gets released because of the uh, allergen being present in the body, uh, it will move through the body, but it won't really cause the immune response because the antihistamine um, medicine attaches to the receptors that histamines use in order to trigger the immune response. And so they kind of compete against the histamine. So if you have a high enough concentration of antihistamine uh, in your medication, uh, you can stop the immune response or you can you never have the immune response happen at all if, uh, if, you got it, if you get it quick enough into your body. Okay, so then let's review going through the specific immune response. And so remember that we have non-specific immunity, which are all those physical barriers like your skin, mucous membrane layers inside the lining of your body, uh, just general phagocytosis of anything that doesn't really belong, it's not really specified, where the specific immune response is when you actually target that exact pathogen that has invaded the body. So building the specific immune response, right? So the pathogen uh, gets into the body, right? And so the pathogen is gonna be engulfed by a macrophage. The macrophage eventually takes the antigen and is going to present it to a helper T cell, right? And so that macrophage uh, presents the uh, antigen or basically the epitage, the, the protein that is the antigen that, that it would help to identify the bacteria, uh, presents it to the helper T cell. Helper T cell uh, can be complementary and gets activated because it's been given this antigen. And so then it will take that and stimulate a B cell uh, by giving them the antigen. And so then the B cell is going to um, make the antibodies that would be appropriate for that antigen. And so then they start making many, many clones of themselves. All right, so these clones develop into uh, plasma cells, which will be responsible for producing the antibodies, and memory cells, which are there to build the immunity if there are any future um, infections of the same pathogen, right? Plasma cells release antibodies, and memory cells are there to react if the pathogen ever returns, thus uh, granting us an immunity against that disease. And so these are, again, the general steps of, of building this specific immunity so that we can be immune to specific pathogens and have a better chance you know, of surviving and avoiding dying of a disease. And if we were to think about the process of building your specific immunity through um, an acquired rather than um, infecting you with their sorry and rather than waiting for you to be infected with the disease if we want to help build your acquired immune system uh, we would use something like a vaccination and so a vaccination will allow you to build immunity against the disease without really ever experiencing it by giving you a part of the pathogen uh, so maybe just giving you the antigens or maybe it will give you uh, an already killed version of the pathogen so we could take the bacteria 
that caused the disease and we could boil it and the solution and so that would kill the bacteria but then the antigens on the surface of the bacteria are still there so you can still build the immune system that way or we might give you a really really weakened one or very low concentration of one in order to allow you to have the immune response but probably you're really not going to get the disease and so if we look at what is actually going to be happening during the vaccination process and we think about the amount of antibodies that are present in the body uh, over time right so vaccines are basically contain the antigens in different ways and once the person is exposed to the vaccine, we can either do it orally uh, through a pill uh, or solution that they drink, or it can be just done through just a, an injection. Most of them are done through an injection. And so we get what we call the primary immune response and then the formation of our memory cells. And so here we have our vaccination. And so at the very beginning point of the vaccination, the antibodies in the body don't exist because we, they haven't been exposed to the pathogen before. And then very, very quickly, the primary immune response occurs. And so there is a buildup of these antibodies as your body um, um, uh, has the pathogen consumed by the macrophage and then the antigen presented to the helper T cells and then the B cells and the B cells dividing, changing into plasma cells and changing into memory cells. Uh, so it's, it's a relatively quick increase in the amount of antibodies in the body, in the blood, but it's actually uh, relatively slow. It's, it's And comparatively to later on when we do the secondary immune response, it is slower. So it does take more time. So there's a good chance during the primary immune response, um, you might feel a little sick. And so there are some instances where people who are given a vaccination uh, might feel a little, a little unwell, not the full disease, but maybe if it's a, a live vaccine, then they, they might start to feel a little bit sick. They might get a little bit of immune response that they actually um, uh, recognize. And so eventually, as those uh, antibodies are being used to help with removing the pathogen that was injected with the vaccine, the antibodies start to decrease over time, right? And so really, they are just being maintained in the body through the existence of memory cells. Now, if you then get infected by that pathogen in real life, well, because of those memory cells, there is the secondary immune response. And the secondary immune response is way stronger and much, much faster. You can see that that line is almost vertical. And so basically, all these memory cells get activated very, very quickly. Um, again, going through the cloning process, uh, releasing more plasma cells, which plasma cells are then going to make and dump a whole bunch of antibodies into the blood. And so since it's so quick and it's a lot stronger, so the amount of antibodies released is significantly higher than before, normally the um, pathogen is, is killed very, very quickly and you have no idea that you were ever infected with anything that might have uh, caused any type of disease. And then there is a slow drop off as eventually those uh, antibodies that weren't used, they will hang around in your blood for a good amount of time, but slowly they will get degraded or reabsorbed or they can be um, uh, filtered out of your blood by your kidneys. And then eventually going back to you know your base level where your memory cell uh, your amount of memory cells is. And then if you ever get infected again, the secondary response occurs again in the exact safe, uh, same type of uh, fashion. When we talk about the different types of vaccines, right? Remember, they have to have the antigen, but we want to make sure that we give someone uh, the vaccine in a way that it's not really going to hurt them, right? So we don't necessarily just give them the, the bacteria or the pathogen. Typically, we give them an attenuated one or basically uh, an inactivated or weakened form of the toxin or sorry, of the pathogen or the virus. Uh, if it's a specific toxin that causes the immune response and not necessarily just an antigen that's on the surface of the bacteria, uh, we can give them a little, a small concentration of that toxin to help them build an immunity against it. Uh, we could also give them uh, subunits of the antigen or just parts of the antigens rather than giving them the whole pathogen. We can just isolate the antigen itself and then we can build the antibodies based on the antigens as they get picked up out of the blood. But essentially the person needs to be exposed to this vaccine, uh, triggering the primary immune response, uh, triggering the formation of the memory cells. And then from the memory cells is where we um, get the secondary immune response and potential uh, um, immunity against that disease if it ever were to uh, occur again. Now, uh, memory cells do not survive uh, for your entire life. So if we want to get a, build a long-term immunity to something, we might have to do uh, regular booster shots. Uh, so every once in a while, uh, earlier in life, when you're actually still developing a lot of your immune system and you're uh, a little bit more, you're prone to, 
um, you're more likely to uh, have a serious infection because you don't necessarily have the best immune system. So when you're a really young kid, you probably remember getting a good number of shots. And so a lot of those shots were vaccines, and some of those shots were boosters for vaccines you are already given in order to help you build uh, a lifelong immunity. So again, this idea, your immunity comes from the fact that you keep getting exposed to these pathogens. So some of you are probably you're immune to polio or you're immune, immune to um, chickenpox, right? Uh, it's not that you never get exposed to polio or you never get exposed to chickenpox or measles, right? For example, from measles um, vaccination is down and so the measles disease is starting to come back again. Uh, it's all around us. It's constantly, you know, you're going to get it at some point in the course of a year or so. Uh, but because you have immunity, you, you um, use the memory cells that you have, you make new memory cells through this process of responding to it, and so you kind of build, rebuild your immunity or refresh your immunity by being exposed to it. If you are not exposed to it for a very long time and those immunity cells die, if the memory cells for that, that build that immunity die, well, then you're no longer immune to it and you actually can get the disease again. And so that's one of the things we think about with um, uh, vaccinations right now. So this idea that uh, people who are not getting vaccinated for measles, for example, uh, the measles disease, which normally never existed in modern society for like the last several decades, or just was almost impossible, or it was very rare to see anyone get a case of measles. Um, now there are hundreds of people getting this disease because they're not being vaccinated. And so the disease, is, which is around us, is getting a chance to grow inside of people uh, and start to cause the disease again. So one of the diseases that we're going to talk about, we, we need to learn more about in terms of our immune system, our immune response, is smallpox. So smallpox is actually one of the uh, very first, or is the first infection to be eradicated by humans uh, by vaccination. So it's the first basic, uh, the idea that everyone on the earth is pretty much immune to smallpox. And so we're, no one should be really getting smallpox anymore as long as they have appropriate medical attention. And so smallpox vaccination uh, basically came, um, uh, oh sorry, uh, during, uh, before I get to the history, uh, history of the idea that it's been removed goes back to the to 1980. It was around the time that the World Health Organization uh, claimed that the smallpox um, is gone and that we don't have any cases or enough cases of smallpox uh, in the world to say that it would ever really come back as long as we maintain uh, the uh, levels of immunity that we get for, through our regular vaccination. So uh, this reason why this program was so successful uh, was because of using vaccinations. So the thing is that polio and measles uh, are, are very, very contagious and so their symptoms are really, really easy to detect. Right, and so smallpox, similar idea. Uh, as you can see from the image, the child that has been infected with the disease has pox, has, has physical bumps and kind of rashy skin that comes from the infection. And so somebody having the disease, it's very, very quick uh, to quarantine them, stop them from spreading it out of control to other people. And so diseases that spread quickly but are easy to determine that somebody has that disease or easy to detect are a lot easier to eradicate because um, it, it, it's much easier to isolate and stop the spread of a contagious disease if we know what people have the disease. Uh, something, some things are difficult to eradicate, for example, uh, immunity like in malaria, for example, is not really complete. Hence, you can be infected uh, multiple times with malaria, so you don't really get full immunity to malaria. You can become less susceptible to it, but there are some diseases like malaria that um, as it changes over time, the development of that immunity isn't really possible. Uh, so you're not fully immune, but you are, have a stronger chance against not getting it. Or we can have things like yellow fever. For example, uh, that have animal uh, reservoir. Basically, they uh, pass through different animal vectors. And so it can be difficult for us to fight that disease because it's not spreading through people, but it's spreading through other animals. And so it, it can be difficult to track and contain animals in nature, uh, especially when if that animal is used uh, in farming or agriculture. And so the whole economic business is built around them. Uh, we don't necessarily are we're that, that great at limiting the spread of a disease when it's going through animals versus uh, people.
Okay, so going back to smallpox, the history of smallpox is being our first vaccination. So the thing is that smallpox is a viral infection, and it was very, very similar to another type of viral infection called cowpox that specifically affected cows. And so it was similar enough that if you were exposed to cowpox, you could build antibodies that would uh, react to smallpox. And so you could gain an immunity to smallpox by being exposed to cowpox, even though cowpox really isn't going to be dangerous to you. It's not, it's a, it could be a minor inconvenience in terms of uh, how it reacts with your skin, but it's not a deadly disease. It's not something you have to worry about uh, if you had some cowpox. And it seems our immune system was strong enough that if you got exposed to cowpox, you could build an immunity against it and you would overcome it. So what happened is that Ed, um, Edward Jenner back in um, 1796 very famously determined, he, he made an observation that people that worked with cows, um, milk made, uh, people that work in the milk and cheese industry and, and farmers that work with cows, sorry, directly, uh, had a very, very low instance of getting smallpox. And in some instances, in, in a town that had lots and lots of smallpox, they might be the only people that seem not to be getting the disease. And so then he started to investigate why this might be, and it came across by interviewing and spending some time with uh, people that work in an industry, understanding this idea of a cow disease that looks very, very similar to what would happen to people. And so that's where this cowpox disease was discovered. And so then he started to theorize that the cowpox disease, which doesn't seem to be dangerous to humans at all, might be, be able to protect them against the smallpox. And so what he did is he created the first vaccine. And so vaccine or vaca comes from the word for cow. So it's basically cow medicine or cow treatment. And so what he did is he took uh, cowpox blisters, right, or scabs from cowpox uh, so that the antigens would be present, right? He didn't know that the antigens would be present, but he took material from that disease and he basically made a small little cut on a boy's arm and he rubbed that material into the skin of the boy. And so the boy was basically given cowpox, right? His immune response kicked in, he got a little sick, but he recovered and he then seemed to be immune against smallpox. And so he could be exposed to things that had smallpox, he could be exposed to people that had smallpox, but he would not in fact get smallpox. Even at one point, Jenner even gave the boy smallpox directly, which is, crosses a lot of ethical lines, but he found that he was immune and he would not get it. So uh, after this success, Jenner repeated on himself, he repeated on increasing numbers of people. And of course, there was a lot of pushback from this. People found this to be really unethical. They found it to be pseudoscience. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand how stuff from a cow's disease could possibly make us get protected from a human disease. And so there was a lot of like bad press that was sent out. There were um, joke comics and articles about the idea that this vaccination would turn you into a, a man-cow hybrid or it would make you turn into a cow entirely or have cow-like features. But of course, uh, none of this is true. Now, there is a lot of ethical problems with this, the idea that there really wasn't any research done on the possible side effects that it could happen for the boy or uh, for himself or the people that he tested on. And of course, there really wasn't that great of consent. An eight-year-old boy isn't, at that time, doesn't really have the authority to really stand up against adults and demand uh, that, that this doesn't happen to him, right? And there are some people that he tested on as well. Maybe they weren't necessarily giving the best informed consent about what was happening to them. And it's just lucky that he was right and that it did help them rather than hurt them. So then one more thing, again, talking about this idea that some diseases can be quite difficult to eradicate, right, versus ones that are uh, easier to deal with. So uh, smallpox, easier to deal with. Uh, polio, measles, and syphilis, they're really, really specific to humans, and so it was easier to develop vaccines against them and to keep those diseases under control because we're only worrying about transmission through humans. However, things like flu, Ebola, and salmonella, those are transmitted through humans and animals, right? And we call this uh, zoonoesis, or the idea that they uh, affect just disease that can be transferred through multiple uh, invertebrates and, and then back into humans as well. Diseases like these are very difficult to control. Uh, some of them might be fairly aggressive, and so it can be difficult to help someone who is infected with it prior to getting really sick and dying, like Ebola is. Um, but because it spreads through multiple vectors, through, spreads through multiple organisms, different types of vertebrates, for example, it can be very difficult to stop the spread of that disease because tracking down and controlling all the animals that might be infected can be quite difficult. 
Okay, next we're going to talk about monoclonal antibodies. And this is the idea of using the immune system or the idea of how immune cells like lymphocytes, like our B cells, function in order to make lots and lots and lots of uh, antibodies for uh, medicine. So that remember, we can give people antibodies as a form as, as passive immunity, right? Uh, or uh, we, so we can use them in different types of specific sciences where we're looking for specific antigens. And so monoclonal antibodies, basically, uh, antibodies are really, really specific to that antigen. And so we can use cells from the immune system to make antibodies that are really specific to other types of materials. So we either be used in therapy in order to help people, for example, rabies. We can use antibodies to help fight against someone getting infected with rabies once they've been bitten by a rabid animal, or using in some diagnostic techniques. For example, we have the ELISA test looking for HIV, testing to see whether or not HIV is present in someone's blood or in someone's donor blood, or how much HIV might be present in an individual. We can be using antibodies that came from uh, these monoclonal groups. And so essentially what it's doing is it's making what is called a monoculture, which is a whole bunch of cells that are all going to be the uh, producing the exact same antibody. So monoclonal being that they are the same clones or they're exactly same to each other and they're all designed to produce the same antibodies. And so this is actually done fairly easily. First, we have to get an immune response um, that will be stimulated uh, to using a specific antigen. And most of them we're using uh, mice for this. And so we inject a mouse with the antigen and we get the mouse's immune system to produce a bunch of B cells that are specific to that antigen. So they're going to make a bunch of antibodies specific to the antigen that we gave the mouse. Then what we do is we use a cancerous cell called a melanoma. And so the melanoma is going to go through very, very rapid cellular division. And what we can actually do is fuse the melanoma tumor cell and the B cells together. Because remember, plasma membranes are quite fluid. And so if you push two cells together in just the right way, you can actually get the cellular contents and the membranes to all fuse together. So this creates our hybridoma, um, which is basically uh, where our monoclonal antibodies are going to come from. And so because it's designed to make that specific antibody based on the antigen that we gave it earlier, and it has the properties of doing lots and lots of cellular division because of the melanoma cell that we uh, com combined with it, the, the myeloma, sorry, that we combined with it, uh, it will do lots of cellular division, and then it will also do lots of activity producing these antibodies. So we create uh, a concentration of these clones of these exact same cell, lots and lots and lots of, like millions to, uh, of these cells, and then, or not many, but thousands and hundreds of thousands of these cells, and then they're going to be producing millions and millions of these antibodies that we can collect, uh, we can separate using centrifuges, if we have an idea of how big they are, their size would be, so we can use centrifugal force to isolate them, and eventually that creates a serum where we can use you know these antibodies for different types of diagnostic diagnostic tests or using them for some type of treatment so again going through these steps so we take the animal inject it with the antigen causing it to make plasma cells we take that plasma cell we harvest it from the spleen of the animal and we're going to fuse it with a tumor cell, most of the time we're going to use a, a myeloma. Uh, that tumor cell, once it's fused with our plasma cell, becomes a hybridoma. And so the hybridoma will do lots and lots of cellular division, and is also going to be very active in order of producing lots of antibodies. And then we isolate those antibodies uh, in large quantities to synthesize um, something used for treatment or some diagnostic tests. Okay. Sorry, that went too quick. You can go back and check that again if you need to. Okay, so uh, next uh, we want to think about how we're going to apply the use of these monoclonal antibodies. Uh, that's going to be through the process. Uh, there's lots of things that we can uh, talk about. We're going to use specifically an example of looking at how pregnancy tests work. Because pregnancy tests are built around using monoclonal antibodies to determine if there is a chemical present in the urine of a female that would be present if she is pregnant. So hopefully that video helps uh, demonstrate a little bit about what it is that's going on when you do a pregnancy test and what a, a control bar is and what a positive and a negative result is going to be. So here I'm going to run through uh, essentially what's happening. And so what we're looking for is a specific compound called HCG. And so HCG is only going to be present if a female is pregnant. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a dipstick and we're going to create a whole bunch of antibodies using the monoclonal antibody process I explained earlier uh, to make antibodies for HCG. And then we're also going to bind them to a tiny little bit of gold particle. All right. So uh, if HCG is present in the urine, uh, the antibodies should bind to HCG because they're designed to fit the HCG compound. Okay, so then as urine travels up the stick, more and more HCG gold antibody complexes are going to be carried with it. And so that's what's happening at part B, right? And so a whole bunch of HCG is uh, connecting with those antibodies, and so they're carrying the antibody and the gold and the HCG. They're all going together as they move through the dipstick, eventually getting towards the lines. And so what happens then is that at some point along the stick, there's going to be HCG gold complex uh, is going to bind to an immobilized anti-HCG gold monoclobial antibodies. And so there are second antibodies right here that are designed specifically only to bind to this, to an antibody if it has HCG. All right, so then this whole complex, that uh, HCG plus the antibody plus the gold, they're all going to get stuck here around point C because there are antibodies attached to the stick at that point. So they're not going to move. And so as they pass by the area, they're going to get stuck um, at that point. And so the collection of these gold particles, if enough gold particles are being carried, we will start to see a line. And so the concentration of gold particles triggers uh, a chemical change in the paper, which leads to the appearance of that ink, of that, uh, that uh, blue line, basically. Okay. Uh, higher up, there are immobilized enzymes that don't need HCG in order for that to appear. And so further up the stick, all right, things that are designed to just deal with this one, the HCG antibody, but not having HCG present. They're further up at line D, or at point D. And so this, of course, is present because it's acting as a control. So if the second line uh, changes dark, that's telling you that the, the chemicals present in the dipstick, in the pregnancy test, uh, are still working. They're functioning the way they're supposed to function. So if you see two lines, that's telling you not only did you get a positive result, so that means HCG must be present, but also that the quality of the material, uh, the dipstick, is working. And so that's, that's good. You have a confirmed positive. If you have no line here at the first one, right? If you have no line at the first one, where, where's my, no line at the first one, but you have a line at the second one, okay? Uh, that means that, oh, sorry, they've reversed the direction. Here, if you've got a line at the second one, the control, but no line at the first one, that means it is a negative because there was no HCG present or there wasn't a lot of HCG present. So that means uh, there wasn't enough to really to get a line at the first point, but the chemicals are working. So the second line, the control line did change colors. And so that means that it is a good um, dipstick and that you should trust these results. However, if this occurs, if you get a line at the first point, but not at the second point. That means you're testing positive for HCG, but then the control line isn't functioning very well. And or that might mean that there could be something wrong with the quality of the chemicals that were used to make this dipstick, or this dipstick might be too old, right? They do have expiration dates with these things because they are biological materials. So that means you should probably do the test again because we can't really confirm or deny uh, whether or not it was successful. And so this is really how a uh, pregnancy test works. And this is a really great example of us using immobilized enzymes, multiple types, sorry, immobilized, multiple types of antibodies, right? And using multiple types of antibodies uh, in order to um, detect for something or, or, or try to test for something. And so you, uh, you, should have, you should be able to explain the general process of how a pregnancy test works. Another thing that we use is the ELISA test that we're looking for um, for HIV, for example. And so if we had a certain, well, we can use it for lots of different types of viruses. It's famously used for HIV because HIV is a you know important virus that we're trying to regulate and stop it from spreading through people, uh, but can be used for any type of virus. And so it's the same idea where in a, a well, we would have a basically uh, these enzymes, or sorry, these um, antibodies, uh, designed to match specific 
um, antigens of the virus. And so what we would do is we would take people's blood uh, or tissue fluid or saliva, depending on where we're trying to test for the, the presence of the virus. And so then we're going to put it in, uh, in, in um, smaller and smaller concentrations or higher dilutions in order to see if you're still testing uh, for the virus. All right, and so they can give us an idea not only if the virus is present uh, in your body, but if there's a lot of it. So how bad of an infection, a viral infection, you might have uh, and gained over time. And they can give an idea of how dire certain types of treatment need to occur based on the quantity of the amount of virus that's present as they keep diluting it uh, smaller and smaller volumes. Okay, I know this one has been an incredibly long video, but we're almost done. So the last thing to deal with 11.1 .1 is this idea of epidemiology. And so epidemiology is the study of the occurrence and distribution and the possible control of diseases. And so when we think about epidemiology, we're doing lots and lots of surveillance of when different diseases occur in different parts of the world and how quickly they spread. Uh, if they have the potential to go from one part of the world to another part of the world, and then what are the best, best tactics, tactics in order to stop the disease from spreading uh, once it has occurred, once there has been uh, an infection that has spread. And so I'll give you an example of critically controlling measles. When there's a measles outbreak, uh, very quickly they try to identify where that outbreak might have originated from, if people have been exposed to the measles, uh, whether or not uh, they could be spreading to different areas and then for taking the disease with them to different locations, uh, resulting in um, an epidemic or even a pandemic, so the spread of this disease um, to new areas. Um, so when we think about uh, controlling diseases, just like measles as an example, the best thing that they can do is detect it early. So before an outbreak gets out of control, what they realize and when a relatively small percent of the population has been infected, they are aware that this has occurred so they can act very quickly. Then they need to possibly look for administrating uh, vaccines if they haven't been used or maybe more effective vaccines uh, should be taken in order to help stop the spread of the disease further through the population. Uh, remind people that they, if they haven't been vaccinated, they really need to be, or if they haven't been vaccinated in, in a very, very long time, they might want to be vaccinated again, uh, just in case that they may have lost the immunity to it. And then they try to estimate of the individuals that have measles, how many of them have the true measles incidence, right, uh, actually infected with the disease and have not been vaccinated, and so the disease will develop properly, versus ones that have been infected with it, but they have uh, some immunity to the disease, and so they are going to recover fairly quickly. And so looking at what small portion of the of true instances have actually uh, occurred, and then thinking about the ones that have got help versus the ones that did not get help because the main concern really comes down to ones who have the disease have not been vaccinated and for some reason or another are not coming to the hospital to get help and so we have to try to statistically think out think how many of these people there might be where they might be and then try to find them to ensure that they are getting help and so uh, most of this is going to be run by the world health organization which has a vast staff of experts uh, field officers, uh, field teams to address different types of outbreaks uh, when they occur uh, for different diseases all around the world. And they do training mechanisms and training exercises, things like that, so they can be uh, very quick and effective uh, if it were to occur. So another thing that the World Health Organization is going to do with their epidemiological studies is they're going to look at different parts of the world and they're going to look at whether or not certain diseases are more plentiful at those, in those parts of the world at different seasons. So this idea of like whether or not a population in a certain part of the world, are they immune to it consistently or is there variation based on region of the world, um, based on season, right? Are we seeing more cases? For example, here we're looking at measles. So we see increases in measles um, in different years and different months. Uh, for different parts of the world, for example, there was an outbreak. And it seemed to be like there was an outbreak in Africa here as the dark blue coloring uh, started to increase. Correspondingly, there was also an increase in the island Pacific or the Western Pacific Islands as well. It could have been the connection between Af people traveling between Africa and um, West Pacific and then also Europe as well. There seemed to be an increase in Europe uh, and a small change in Southeast Asia, but it's, so there could have been some type of connection with the movement of the disease between Africa, Europe, and uh, Western Pacific. 
Here later on we see a shift where it seems like Africa now has its measles distribution, measles outbreaks under relative control, except uh, now Southeast Asia has had a massive increase and Western Pacific has also had a fairly large increase. Uh, and so we, there's a charting how um, outbreaks occur in different parts of the world uh, over multiple decades and over different seasons help give them an idea if there's going to be a seasonal occurrence or if there's something related to travel uh, we see where they see an increase uh, in the occurrence of the disease in that part of the world and so the last thing here is looking at just some uh, practice questions and so this could be an example of something you might see in a dbq so they, we would have saw that data that i just had on the previous slide and then here are some questions that would go with the data uh, as a dbq like question all right, so what you can do is um, you can pause this uh, and go find that image uh, in, in the PPT, uh, and you can try answering these questions if you haven't done so already. All right, so then going through this, looking at the annual pattern of data across all the regions, we see that outbreak kind of starts in January, seems like it peaks leading on to April and May, on to the, the spring seasons, and then there is a relatively quick decline in the summer months, and so that gives them an idea of how seasons are going to affect the occurrence of this disease. Identify regions most greatly affected by the outbreak that seem to be Southeast Asia, Western Pacific, and Africa. All seem to have similar levels of occurrences in those regions uh, outside uh, other outbreaks. And then think of 2010, identify the regions in which the instances of measles is increasing, uh, decreasing, and remaining constant. 2010, Western Europe saw an increase. Southeast Asia and Western Pacific saw, an, sorry, Western Europe saw, an, uh, saw a decrease. Southeast Asia and Western Pacific saw an increase. And other regions of the world were relatively consistent. And then despite having established vaccinating program in most countries, Europe has been a peak in measles instances between 19, 2010 and 2013. Suggest a reason for this. And hint, try to uh, uh, try an internet search on measles vaccines in Europe, particularly in the UK. So uh, you guys are probably already kind of aware about this, but we saw that it was a, a pretty small, or a pretty rapid decline in vaccines uh, for the MMR vaccine, which includes the um, measles, mumps, and rubibula, or the idea of uh, the measles vaccine, because of, there was a scare that the vaccines led to autism. Even though there was no evidence to support that this was true, and the evidence that was supposedly used to show that this was true was falsified, it took a good while for people to um, re-educate themselves on the truth about how vaccines uh, help us and how they don't cause autism. And so during this period, the decrease in vaccination allowed the disease to gain control or gain a footing uh, in the population and start to spread. And so we can see very this is a really good example of the idea that how vaccination does help protect us from diseases, but vaccination has to be fairly consistent. If it falls apart or if it stops getting done, it can uh, lower vaccination levels. Okay, so that's it for 11.1. .1. Sorry it was so long. Probably should have broken it down in the, into smaller sections. Uh, but that's it. That's all the high-level content for stuff about diseases and the immune response.